Hello everybody, for those who've watched my videos before, you would know that I like to build things like bots, robots, AI and other tech stuff. However, what you might not know is that I like to build pretty much anything. I've built boats, furniture, I do lots of landscaping, fixing up the house and recently, while looking for further projects to keep me busy during lockdown, I thought I would try something new, making knives. In fact, this is one example that my son and I put together, our first try. It's a Viking style sea axe or sax. Um, don't worry, it's not actually sharp, um, but it is rather pointy. The problem is, you need high carbon steel for making decent knives, at least those that hold an edge. And that is hard to find and very expensive. However, due to the YouTube algorithm feeding me with videos on my latest interest, I discovered it's possible to carbonize low quality steel. Even more interestingly, this carbonizes from the outside in, leaving a flexible low carbon steel core surrounded by hardened high carbon steel. The result should be a blade somewhat like a differentially hardened katana blade, flexible yet with a durable edge. Sounds promising. So, as another interesting lockdown project, I thought I would test this theory. I'll put a link in the comments to the video that gave me the idea so you can learn from that video as well as the process I go through here. But let's talk about the plan. I figure if I make two small lengths of katana sized blades, carburize one of them, then we'll have a simulated sword fight between the two and we'll see how each of the edges holds up. I'm making this video progressively as I work, so at this stage, even I don't know how this is going to work out. So let's take a look at how things go. I started with a cheap 20 odd dollar 7mm thick steel lintel from my local hardware. These are galvanized, so firstly I had to ground off the zinc coating to expose the steel underneath. Then I ground an edge onto one side and cut out two short lengths that I could use for the testing. One will be carburized as part of the heat treating and then quenched in oil. The other will simply be heat treated and quenched in oil, which is the standard approach to harden high carbon steel. Now the video that I watched called for a mixture of salt, flour and some form of carbon. Um, I'm not quite sure the role of the salt, but I'm assuming the flour is there to sort of bind it all together into a kind of dough you can wrap around your steel samples. Um, for the carbon, what I did was smash up some charcoal that I'd purchased from the local hardware shop also into a very fine powder and then I mixed these together in the suggested ratio of six parts of carbon with four parts of salt and three parts of flour. Then, I, after mixing these thoroughly, I added in a little bit of water to make a thick paste and what you then do is take this and you wrap it around the steel samples as you can see in the video here. You want to ensure that you coat well the edge where you want the carbon to be absorbed to harden the steel. And while I covered the whole thing, I'm not sure that's so important unless you need the entire piece of steel to be hardened. The carbon wrapped sample was then left to dry along with the uncarbon wrapped sample and a knife blank that I'd also created and wanted to carbonize. Now I want these to dry out pretty well because the process of carbonizing should be done without oxygen. So you wrap the carbon wrapped sample in clay that prevents any air getting inside. So as long as there's no moisture being given off, I'm not going to potentially create steam and break the uh, the clay wrapper around the sample as we're carburizing it in the forge. And as you can see there's a small cut in one of the samples which will allow us to differentiate them later on when we're doing our testing. The clay was fast drying so it just needed a few days to dry and then I put it into my simple backyard forge surrounded by some charcoal barbecue bricks. Then with the addition of some forced air I left it to cook at high heat for around two hours to hopefully absorb those carbon atoms. Before quenching, I warmed up the oil a little using a hot piece of steel to ensure it was viscous enough to cool our samples properly, which is something else I learned from YouTube. While my carbon wrapped sample was cooking, I heated up my control piece in the forge and then quenched it in the oil, much like you would heat treat high carbon steel. This was to ensure that the only difference between the two was the carbon treatment process. After around two hours, I took out the clay and carbon wrapped sample. On a heat proof surface, I carefully broke it open. 
The steel inside looked like it had been heating up very well, and hopefully therefore had been absorbing carbon from the charcoal, salt and flour mixture wrapped around it. Then I quenched it in oil, just like with the non-carbon wrapped sample. After they had cooled down, I tempered them in the oven on an old pizza tray for an hour at 200 degrees. Now that we have our two samples, the first test is to run a file across each sample and see how well the file can penetrate the steel. First I tested our control sample. Then I ran the file across the carburised sample. I tried to use the same pressure and length of the strokes as I did with the first sample. Finally I compared the file marks. You can see that the file does seem to have penetrated deeper on the non-carburised sample. So, after our first test, it does seem we've improved the steel. But the real test is, whose sword will win in battle? Because nobody's going to bring a file to a sword fight. So, to test this, I needed a way to bring one blade down hard against the other in a controlled fashion. As you can see here, I did that by putting one piece in my trusty vise, holding the other with vise grips, and then using a rubber mallet to cause a collision. And just in case it somehow mattered which one was in the vise, I made sure I swapped around the samples so that I was approaching this whole test in a scientific manner. And frankly, I was shocked by the result, in a good way. The control sample has deep gouges where the two edges collided, while the carburised edge is barely scratched. In fact, I can drag my fingernail along it and there's no dent in the edge at all. But would our carburised sword have snapped in the midst of battle? Well, let's try the whack it with a hammer test. It seems that because the core of the blade is still flexible steel, that it resists a strong blow with the hammer. So, I guess I've proven that you don't need special steel to make a strong blade. Fun historical fact, this is part of the process that was used to produce Damascus steel, which was renowned for its strength and hardness. Uh, so, when COVID morphs into a zombifying virus, get yourself a grinder, a bag of charcoal, some clay, and a cheap steel lintel from your local hardware, and you'll be set, because there's only two ways to kill a zombie, fire, and taking their heads off. So, thank you for watching this video. That's the end. As I mentioned, it's a little bit more hands-on than my normal technology videos. I'm off to prepare for the forthcoming zombie apocalypse. Bye.